know if any of you were watching. I came up here when I thought that song was drawing to a close. It had a surprise, uh, surprise ending there. Hey, welcome to worship this morning. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, we have gathered today to turn our attention and our affection to Jesus in worship. How about that? What a glorious task. So welcome this morning. If you are a guest this morning with us, I'm so honored that you're here. Thanks for being here. If you're a first-time guest, what a brave thing to do today, to walk in this building not knowing anybody, uh, to worship Jesus with us. I'm so glad that you're here. If you are a first-time guest, my name's Marshall. I'm the pastor here, and I would love to meet you if we haven't met, obviously. Uh, and there's a, a, a first-time guest table in the foyer. We have a gift for you, so please visit that today if you're here with us for the first time. Uh, in the middle of our service, just kind of a, a point of reference here, our children who are pre-K through first grade, they do leave for Children's Church. That departure is pretty obvious. Uh, they go to the second floor children's wing where they can be collected after the service or after Sunday school. But if you are a guest with us, you're not in our computer system, there's a little tag inside your pew racks. Uh, one part of that goes on your child, one part of that you keep for yourself. We match up those numbers after the service. So you get the right child and the right child gets you. And so we're always happy when that works out. Uh, we have with us Dr. Brad Fricks. The TV's covering him now. Uh, Brad Fricks was here as our pianist for... Yeah! <laughs> Dr. Brad Fricks. I love it. I love it. Uh, he was our pianist for a long time, and he's here with us helping us in worship today. Our, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 103. Allow me to read it to you, and then let's reflect upon this together. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. What kind of mood are you in this morning? Maybe you, you slid into worship today. Maybe you're ready. Maybe you're not so ready. Uh, we, all, we all think about that. I mean, what, this morning as we gather together, what, what kind of mood is God in when we come to meet with him? Well, this psalm tells us, doesn't it? He is in a faithful, steadfast, faithfulness mood. He is in a gracious mood. He's not in a nitpicky mood. He's in a merciful mood. He's in a loving mood as we gather to worship today. So, for all who are weary and need rest, you will find it in the Lord. For all who mourn and long for comfort, you will find it in the Lord today. For all who fail and desire strength, you will find it in this Lord today. And for all who sin and need a Savior, you will find it in the Lord today. This church opens wide its doors in a welcome to you this morning. I'm able to say welcome to you because the Lord Jesus Christ himself has opened wide his arms and welcome to you. Welcome to worship. Now, we have the opportunity to pass that welcome along to one another, that love, that grace. And so I invite you in the moments ahead to stand, to take a moment or two to get to know those around you, to greet them, to say hello, and to say welcome to worship. Let's stand together.
Well, as you find your way back to your seat, grab that songbook, hymn number 56, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Words will also be here on the screen. Let's sing together. boys and girls. You guys like my backpack? Yeah. How many of you already have a backpack for school? Anyone? I don't see any hands. No one has. Okay, there we go. How many of you already have your school supplies all ready to go? Yeah. Well, if you don't, don't worry. There's still some time before school, but I am wearing this backpack this morning, not because I'm going to school, but because we are getting ready for a big event where we get to go and hand out free backpacks and school supplies and shoes to kids who live in the Sequoia community. So if you have not heard about Hesed House, Hesed House is a home that's located in the Sequoia community um, that Miss Jeannie Manning kind of manages and runs, and she has a ministry there where not just one time a year, but all throughout the school year, kids can come to that trailer and they receive snacks after school. They get to hear Bible studies from Miss Jeannie and really just get to be in close relationship with followers of Jesus. Um, and so we are so excited to go tomorrow night. So tomorrow night, let me tell you what we're going to do. So there's going to be some food, as always. Anytime there's a good time, you got to have food. So there's going to be some food. There's going to be some snow cones, and there are going to be backpacks and shoes that we are giving out to children full of school supplies. Now, these children tomorrow night, they do not have to do anything to receive these backpacks. We're not going to have a credit or a debit card machine. There's not going to be anyone taking up cash. Um, the kids don't have to look a certain way or act a certain way. They don't have to show us their report cards or anything like that. We are not going to make them do jumping jacks to receive these backpacks. They just get to have them. And before we talk about more about the backpack event, I thought what a good opportunity for us to think about the gift that we've been given in Christ. Um, and that is that God the Father sent Jesus so that we could have eternal life. And that is a gift that we don't have to do anything to receive. We don't have to look a certain way or act a certain way or do a list of things. We just 
get to receive it. And that's for all of us in this room. We've all been offered that gift. And so that is why we go into the community. We want kids to have school supplies, but ultimately we want them to know that there is a God who has given them a gift that is so much greater, and that is eternal life with him. And so we have the opportunity tomorrow to go and to do this. And so if you have not had the chance to sign up to go with us tomorrow night and you would like to go, there's always something that you can do. Um, so come find me or Marshall or Jeannie Manning, um, and we would love to help you know how to get involved tomorrow night. And I also just want to say thank you to those who have given money for shoes or also handing out shoes. I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but... I had the great privilege of buying 44 pairs of Crocs this week, and it was so much fun. So thank you for giving and um, for donating school supplies. And if you haven't done that yet and you would like to, there is still a little bit of time to do that. So I just want to say thank you. And I also want to ask if you will pray with me for not really the backpacks. We don't care about praying for the backpacks. We want to pray for the children who are going to be receiving these backpacks that they would get a taste of God's love and his kindness tomorrow night through this free gift. So would you pray with me? Um, God in heaven, we thank you so much for the free gift that you have given to us. Um, when I think about 1 John, it says, see what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. God, thank you that we have reasons to be generous and to be kind and gracious because you have been so generous and kind and gracious to us. Um, so, Father, we pray for tomorrow night's event. Um, God, there's so many details that go into it. Um, God, we pray that things would run smoothly. Um, God, we pray um, that you would keep the rain away as there is uh, just a high percentage of rain. Father, we pray that we would be able to have our event tomorrow night. Um, God, we pray that, um, just ultimately, Lord, we pray that children would come and they would receive these backpacks, Lord, um, that they would leave with the taste of your goodness and your kindness, um, that they would see in our expressions and the way that we communicate with them that um, we are different because we've been changed by you. And so, yeah, Lord, I just pray also for Miss Jeannie Manning, as she ministers to these children week in and week out, Lord, I pray that you would give her wisdom to know how to minister best. God, help us to join her in those efforts. And God, we ultimately pray that you would bring fruit in these children's lives, Lord, that you would save them, you would give them just, um, give them gospel hope for the things that they're facing. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, Lord, we just entrust this event to you and just ask that you would bless it and that it would be a sweet night of reflecting on your goodness and your gifts to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. To continue our service, uh, Grace Flows Down uh, is uh, one of our wonderful uh, worship uh, reflective pieces. Uh, I've asked Jill Curry if she'll lead out for us, remind us how... This melody goes, and then we'll join her. Uh, remain seated for the moment, though, please. Stand with me and let's sing with her. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing love, now flowing now from hands and feet. 
Good morning, everybody. In full disclosure, I had to look up diaconal, <laughs> but it means pertaining to deacons. And uh, Brother Marshall asked me to speak for just a few minutes about uh, deacon service and what it means to me. Uh, I've had the honor this year of serving as the vice chairman of the deacon body, and uh, over the last three years, I've been uh, involved mainly with ordinance, and uh, I now have a major in communion and a minor in baptism. <laughs> so I think I'll get my degree in, in September. But, uh, let's take a brief stroll down memory lane. Uh, Beth found this in the archives at home. Uh, this is September 19th, 2004, the ordination of Dr. Daniel Mintz in deacon ministry. Now, at that time, most of the time, this was on a Sunday night or Wednesday night, but uh, our pastor, Dr. Pat McFadden, decided to make this. I was the only candidate, so it was Sunday morning with the TV and all that. Thank you, Dr. Pat. <laughs> we, we love you, Dr. Pat. Uh, and um, what was interesting, uh, looking at the bulletin, uh, Deacon Chairman was Bob Johnston, uh, thank you for your service. I'll never forget, it's probably the last time my dad was able to come to church. He was right there uh, in his wheelchair and uh, something that you never forget. And I was not going to do this. Uh, but uh, when you talk about deacon service and what it means to me, I think first and foremost, it's service. Uh, deacons are servants. And I think that's the, the, number, one, um, the number one job is, is to be a servant. Uh, secondly is 
being present. Um, I think of my alma mater, JSU, which some people say is just show up. Uh, now, sometimes you may not feel like attending. Uh, it may not be something that seems terribly interesting, but uh, sometimes just be there. You, you never know. You never know. Uh, other people might need to see you there. You may receive a blessing that you hadn't planned on. The third thing is mercy. I think uh, deacons are to be merciful. People in need, uh, widows, uh, that's a big part of, of the deacon ministry is being merciful, uh, being supportive, supportive to our pastor, supportive to our staff uh, is a major function. And uh, uh, lastly, administrative, and kind of put that last for a reason, that's, that's not the big, of course we meet monthly, but that's, that's probably number five. I mean, all the other things uh, are probably more important. That's important too, the business of the church, which we take seriously. And in all of this, I think we set the culture of the church uh, of love and uh, mercy. We're going to, I'm one of five that's rotating off, and we're going to have Deacon, uh, we're going to count the ballots around 11. And those of you that are candidates for Deacon service, uh, Go ahead and start examining your hearts now. And uh, my philosophy has always been if the church chose me to serve, I was going to serve if I was able. That's an individual decision for each of you, but please be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit uh, in that matter. And uh, it's, it's important. So let me close us in a prayer. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to be in your house once again. We thank you for our church, our church staff, and we just ask in the matter of deacon selection, uh, you already know who the candidates will be. Just help us to be faithful and uh, ask that your will be done. For in all things, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Danny, as we continue our worship, blessed assurance, uh, Jesus is mine, I'll ask that you stand. Let's continue our singing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. As we continue, Is He Worthy, if you remember this song, is a series of questions to which then we respond. I've asked Bob if he'll lead out and ask those questions here in the beginning, and you all respond, as indicated, uh, with the answers to those questions, and then ultimately we'll all sing together. But let's sing, Is He Worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, 
worthy. Adults, if you'll remain standing just for a few moments, we'll have our scripture reading, but at this time, children, you are dismissed to children's church. Adults, remain standing, please. This week's scripture reading is James 3, 13 through 18. If you're using a pew Bible, it can be found on page 1198. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. This is the word of the Lord.
So James asks this question at this point in his epistle, and the question is, who is wise in understanding among you or among us? And so we ask that question together this morning. It's a question that we must all wrestle with, who is wise in understanding among us, and we need some help to know the answer and to discover the answer. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask you to do what only you can do. Touch dead hearts and make them alive again. God, be gracious to us. There is so much that we do not yet know, so we ask you to teach us. There is so much that we have not yet obeyed. Compel us, Lord. And there is so much that we have not yet become. Make us that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I remember my first real personal realization in wisdom uh, my mother, uh, on repeat throughout my teenage years, um, I, I think I was a, a well-behaved kid, but a little bit argumentative, uh, perhaps. Um, and so on repeat throughout my teenage years, uh, kind of to kind of end a, com- a, a conversation I was having with my mother about how we disagreed about things, she would say something like this, I'm older, I've lived a little longer, I'm a lot wiser than you. And that really meant that's the end of the story. And that's really kind of like the liturgy of mom. I'm older, I've lived longer, and I'm a lot wiser. End of story. And, and okay, like I can accept that. She was older, she had lived longer, she was wiser. Uh, and then one day, there was an instance of 16-year-old me who then turned to my 13-year-old brother, um, and I'm sort of dressing him down in a disagreement we're having with one another, all right? And I evoked the wise saying, I'm older, I've lived longer, I'm a lot wiser than you. End of story. Now, that would be great, right? Like 13, 16, I'm older, wiser, live longer, so on and so forth. But mother overhears this, and mother interjects herself and says, no, just because you're older and live longer doesn't mean that you're wiser. That won't settle this. Now, you can imagine the confused 16-year-old that I am after listening to the Liturgy of Mom all these years. Um, I don't know what I said in the moment. Now, this was, my parents did most of their parenting in the 90s. I probably said nothing in the moment, because in the 90s, you could knock your kid down, and it'd be called good parenting, right? Um, But I was just confused. Like, I'm just repeating what I hear all the time. And I thought, 16-year-old me, I thought right there in that moment, this is the first lesson in wisdom. Huh, how about that? Uh, what, What is wisdom then? Listen, we need wisdom. We need to get wisdom. James says in chapter 1 of his epistle, we even need to ask for wisdom. And we, as we go through all the pain and all the trials and we desire to come out the other side, not bitter and spiraling downward, but mature and complete, we need wisdom. And that story that I told about my childhood is is nearly 24 years old now. And although I tell it somewhat critically today, still confused about what all was going on there, It it does lead us to really a great insight that James gives us immediately in our passage. He says, who, who is wise and understanding among us? And he uh, answers it immediately. The wise and understanding among us, it's it's not about talk and it's not about rhetoric. Uh, It's not assumed or presumed. It has nothing to do with who got here first or who's old or anything like that. He just says this, who's wise and understanding among, among us? Let him show it. Not claim it, show it. By good conduct, by works done in the meekness of wisdom. And in that one little verse, James does give us wisdom's first lesson. He talks about the meekness of wisdom there. Uh, He's given us really this, he's taken us right into the heart of true wisdom in just a couple words. Meekness is not Uh, was not typically celebrated as a virtue in the ancient world. And Jesus comes along and he talks about the the beatitudes, the flourishing life, blessings from God. He said, blessed are the meek. The meek are able to say things like this. This is who I am and this is who I'm not. In fact, the meek display true humility. And so we're able to say, this is who I am. I'm a creature. I'm a creation. This is who I'm not. In the broadest sense, I'm not the creator. I'm not God. So wisdom's first lesson is worship. This is what James is driving us toward. Wisdom, true wisdom, uh, begins with the knowledge which worship of God and God alone brings into our lives. It's relational knowledge of the Lord as he's captured our awe and worship. 
And as he captures our all in worship, he reorders our souls, he reorders our minds, he reorders our body and devotion and commerce and thought and all of our ways. This is really the, the ancient wisdom from even Proverbs. We can connect the dots. So wisdom, wisdom is, is knowing what to do, what you should do, and when to do it, and how to do it in those times in life where life goes off-road. I talk to you about this all the time. Most of life is lived a little bit off-road where there's not just a one-to-one ratio of a Bible rule to a, to a situation. It's these place, wisdom happens in the places where moral goodness and strength of character have to go off into the ditch a little bit. And wisdom deals with how the world really works. It deals with the connectedness of all of life. It deals with the nuance of all things in life. Wisdom is to know God and how God wants you to deal faithfully when life has gone off script or when there is no script for that. So we go back to Proverbs and we learn that wisdom can be found. God has not put wisdom up on the top shelf. It's accessible for those who seek it. And in Proverbs, we're told explicitly where wisdom begins. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Now, the, the writer of Proverbs, or one of the, one of the writers of Proverbs here, uh, is making this point. In fact, Proverbs is, is like a, a book where a lot of it is, is phrased like a father speaking to a son. He's saying, son, pull up your chair to the table and listen. And one of the ways that this father teaches his son is by telling a little story. And in Proverbs chapter 8 and chapter 9, you find the father speaking to a son, telling a little story. He talks to his son about these two women who will vie for our lives. Woman wisdom and woman folly. I love, this is chapter 8, verse 32, through the rest of chapter 9, I believe. Uh, one of my favorite parts of Proverbs and of the whole Bible. So woman wisdom and woman folly. And he tells his son, choose the right woman to love. It's kind of like a country song at that point. And he says something like this, woman wisdom calls openly leave your way, walk in my path, learn and live. If you find me, you find life. That's what woman wisdom calls out and says. So she calls from the high place in the city, and nothing is hidden in woman wisdom's call. She doesn't promise anything besides life. She doesn't promise an an easy path or a, a smoothed over path. She says, whatever the path is and wherever it leads, if you come to me, wisdom says, you will find in the end, you will find life. Of course, we can, we can hear echoes of that in Jesus' words, can't we? Where he tells us to do things like deny ourselves, take up our cross, follow him, lose life to gain life. It's open, it's honest. He tells you exactly where this is going. Now, woman folly instead, or by contrast, woman folly seduces. She says you can have it all at no cost. That's Proverbs 9, 17. She offers stolen goods. And so whereas woman wisdom says, hey, follow, you're walking in a way, you're walking in a path, woman folly says, no, here it is. You can have it in an instant. You can have it now. And of course, Proverbs, this whole passage, will cast the light where woman folly will not cast the light. Proverbs 9, 18 shows us what woman folly doesn't want us to see. Woman folly calls us to her home in the high place, but we're told that the house guests are dead there. The guests are in the depths of Sheol. All her house guests are buried and hidden beneath her floorboards. What's that all about? Why would the father speak to the son in this way and tell this story? Well, really what's at stake here if we're paying attention to Proverbs is more than just good choices and poor choices. We know that woman wisdom calls out from the highest place in the city. Woman folly calls out from the highest place in the city. That's where their, their houses are in the highest points. If you think about the ancient world, the highest points in any cities were reserved for what? For temples, for deities. They were the places, the high places where the deities dwell. So, in fact, what this father is even speaking to the son through these two women, he's saying, the Lord calls, and also the Baals call, the idols call to you. Who will be worshipped? Who will be embraced? And so he says, so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Real worship is the beginning of wisdom, not worship as a ritual, real worship of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a God who has captured your attention and your affection and your all, who is reshaping your heart and your mind and your body and your commerce and your thoughts and your ways. In the New Testament, we get this confession, the the wisest confession you will ever make is a confession of worship. It's that Jesus is Lord. 
And early Christians got into a lot of trouble for confessing that Jesus is Lord because it meant that Caesar is not Lord, others are not Lords. Jesus is Lord, Lord of our minds, Lord of our bodies, Lord of our devotion, Lord of our commerce, Lord of our thoughts, Lord of our ways. This good confession, Jesus is Lord, makes us wise in all of our ways. It is the meekness of wisdom, a humbling, a bowing to him. You know, and practically this means that in order to humble ourselves meekly under this, this God, this Lord, we, we've got to know who the God of the Bible is. We've got to increasingly know who the God of the Bible is and not just presume it. Flannery, Flannery O'Connor, the author, made this incredible observation about the religious South. She called it Christ-haunted. If you think about what she's talking about, Christ haunted in the religious South. It's like he's a spook that everyone knows a little bit about, talks a little bit about, even shudders sometimes, but someone who is rarely known and rarely ever seen. For us now, who gather together weekly, we might say it this way, that, that churches are filled with people who are God of the Bible haunted or even biblically haunted people but on the whole, really don't know what he's like because they don't know how he's revealed himself. It's something like we know, we know the God of the Bible like we half know song lyrics. Uh, great example just landed in my lap. I was talking to, to David Killian on Friday morning, and the conversation went toward the direction of talking about uh, the musician Gordon Lightfoot. Now, Gordon Lightfoot passed away in, in 2023, and so David was telling me about Gordon Lightfoot, and he's like, you know, you sang that song, Sundown. Do you know that song? You know that song? And, I, and, I, and at first I didn't recognize the title, and so, so David on the phone, this is a funny story about David Killing, because I don't know, he's not necessarily his singer in my book, but he goes, he goes, Sundown. Sometimes, I, he didn't sing all that. But, you know, you know, like, do you know the rest of the words of that? You know, Sundown. It sort of rolls into a, a, a mumble hum, doesn't it? That's how we know song lyrics. We know the beginning, and it rolls into this mumble hum. And I thought, how perfect. We know the song, but do we really? But do we really? Many of us know just enough about the God of the Bible to be a proper pagan. We cannot use Bible words like holiness and then just mumble hum our way through what it means. God tells us exactly what holiness is. We can't just use Bible words like truth and then mumble hum our, the, our, our way through what it means. You know, we fill it in with our own definitions and our own bravado and our own popular opinion. We can't just say the words mercy and then mumble hum what they mean. God has told us what it means. We don't fill it in with our own opinions and bravado and popular opinion. We don't say the word love and then fill it in with what it means. God has told us. God has told us. God is not tagging you in so you can take it from here. Some of us think that we are God's gift to wisdom. We are God's gift to common sense. God is God's gift to wisdom. God is God's gift to common sense and uncommon sense, something that flows from heaven. Rich Velotis posted this this week. I have no desire for Christianity that emphasizes relationship with Jesus without taking seriously his teachings, or emphasizes the teaching of Jesus without taking seriously the call to deep communion with him. The beginning of wisdom is to desire the king and to desire the kingdom, to do the work to know the king, to do the work to worship the king. So then we're counseled by James to know thy wisdom. This is really a spoof on Socrates who said, to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible disagrees with Socrates, but we are told by James to know thy wisdom. Verses 14 through 17 teaches about two wisdoms, quote unquote, who are claimed to be some form of wisdom but are antithetical to one another. Wisdom from above versus wisdom from below. So James would say there's a kind of wisdom, a way of getting on well in the world, which even religious people will bless and baptize and call wisdom and stretch out for it and say, God, I'm wise. 
But he says, this is not wisdom from above. It's not from God. Instead, James says, you can look at the passage here. James says this is earthly, meaning from the earth as a closed system, not flowing from the God of heaven. It is unspiritual. It's it's not saying that it's, you know, it might be, your wisdom might be very spiritual sounding. It might have biblical half-truths, but unspiritual is something not born of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say this. This is wisdom that is also demonic. In the end, is crooked and calculated and a lie. Know thy wisdom. Your wisdom will tell you exactly what it is. In fact, James here in this passage, he identifies two vices tied to wisdom from below. One is jealousy, or your translation may say rivalry or bitter zeal. It's the kind of harshness that comes when we perceive that we have something to protect. So either we're protecting ourselves, so we're harsh about that carping and criticizing, not letting a nice word go by without correcting it with a nasty one. Or maybe we feel like we're protecting a truth that we have to protect. There's a challenge for God's people to contend for the faith with uh, strength and with charity. It's a challenge for God's people to be able to tell the truth about the world and about the way the world is without turning into people who are perpetual grumble, who have only a cutting word to say about everyone and everything. So James says, you can know if your wisdom is from below because it's marked by this jealousy, this rivalry, this bitter zeal. And he also says, marked by selfish ambition, a kind of internal rivalry within ourselves in which we feel like we have something of someone else's that we need to possess. So it means that we love by selfish ambition to love our advancement by unevening the playing field, really, for our behalf. We would like to get ahead. We would like to solidify our place. We would like to have power. We would like to have position. We would like to have security. We would even evoke the name of God to get it. How about that? But wisdom is not doing the things that we want. In Jesus' name, right? It's doing the thing Jesus wants. Jesus' way. And that's important. The things he wants. His way. We look at the marks of wisdom from above. Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and of good fruit, impartial and sincere. Wisdom from above is pure, it says, a singleness of will pursuing the holy God. It is peaceable, gentle, open to reason. You know how it can be peaceable and gentle and open to reason? Because at the center of the universe is not me. I have much to learn. I have much to take in. I have much to share and to give in myself. Take it in from God, learn from God, from other people as we exchange with other people. There's a necessary humility that comes with relationships. Can you imagine the necessary humility that comes with a relationship with the God of the universe? Listen, not being God is so helpful in becoming a person who's open to reason. Not being omniscient, so helpful if we just realize that, into being a person who's open to reason. This wisdom from above is marked by being full of mercy and good fruits. And I would just describe this this way. You, you can meet a person who's full of mercy and good fruits, and, it, you, and usually the reflection upon them goes something like this. Hmm, that person was not hung up on being the wisest person in this room. But a lot of people were blessed when she opened her mouth, when she stretched out her hand, even and especially to those who needed it most, regardless of being a friend or an outsider or even an enemy, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. We know exactly what we're getting from a wise person versus them being hot and cold and two-faced. Know thy wisdom. So we ask this question, how familiar is our wisdom with the way of Jesus? You know, I, I think about some of the things that Jesus says, and like we, we go to the Beatitudes, and we think about the Beatitudes, and if we're actually honest with ourselves, the Beatitudes of Jesus somewhat drive us nuts. Like we read them, we're like, Jesus, I kind of wish you'd said something else. Let's take, a, let's take a, like a, a wisdom from above and wisdom from below test. You want to do that with me this morning? Which list of things do you wish that Jesus had said? 
which list of things would you more readily celebrate had he said them? And this is our way of finding out if our wisdom is in line with Jesus' way. Now, J.B. Phillips, years ago, rendered a, a different version of the Beatitudes. They were the Beatitudes of the kingdom of the world. Here they are. So instead of saying blessed, we'll say happy. Happy are the pushers, for they get on in the world. Happy are the hard-boiled, for they never let life hurt them. Happy are they who complain, for they get their own way in the end. Happy are the blasé, for they never worry over their sins. Happy are the slave drivers, for they get results. Happy are the knowledgeable men of the world, for they know their way around. Happy are the troublemakers, for they make people take notice of them. These are the Beatitudes of the kingdom of the world. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. There's one list. There's one. Does this sound like your wisdom, by the way? It's not like we pass on. This is how we get. This is how we all, how we get along well in life, son. Jesus said this instead, though. Matthew chapter five, verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Which one? Which one do you wish Jesus had said? Which list do you operate by? And ultimately, this is the challenge to know thy wisdom. Which wisdom are you operating by? James also tells us that wisdom does the work. There's a harvest of righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. And here's what, here's what this work is. It is simply the prayer of St. Francis, the peace prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. This is the work of wisdom. That's what James says. Sow peacemaking. Reap a harvest of righteousness. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And here's where we end. What we love doing talking about the wisest master in the universe. So here's the question. Like, I get it, all this churchy stuff, pure and peaceable and gentle and sowing peace. Here's the question. Here's the real question. The real question, skeptic this morning, longtime church member skeptic, does this wisdom work? Because we're tempted to think, what does meekness solve? What does gentleness and peacemaking solve? Does it even work? Is that efficient? Is that effective? Is that powerful? Does that get results? Let me pause for a moment and say praise be to Christ who has not dealt with us in an expedient way, in an efficient way, but according to the wisdom of love. Praise be to Christ. You know, Philippians 2 teaches us a little bit about the wisdom of God. Philippians 2.5 Paul writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus. Jesus, the wisest master in the universe, entered into the world of the wisdom of the Romans, uh, the wisdom of clanging swords and strong arm and power of death. Jesus, the wisest master and lord of the universe, emptied himself. Jesus, the wisest master and lord of the universe, rode into Jerusalem on his final trip, gentle, riding on a donkey, secure, ready to do battle with everything that was evil and wrong and weak and suffering in this world. Jesus, the wisest master in the universe, let happen to him what happened to him, the evil done to him. He was betrayed and arrested and mocked and whipped and crucified and even from the cross. The wisest master in the universe says, forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. Even when he was circled and spit upon, Jesus, the wisest master and Lord of the universe, rests in the path the Father is giving, given, had given him, knowing exactly why he came. And listen to this, all the bad and all the evil and all the enemies and all the weakness and all the suffering of the world was no match for Jesus' strength, the unmatched wisdom of the cross. Not expedient wisdom, dying love. This is the way the world is saved. This is the way you and I are saved, healed and forgiven is because of the humble saving love of Jesus, the peacemaking, saving love of Jesus, the gentle, saving love of Jesus, the wise, saying, saving love of Jesus. Is there enough wisdom in the way of Jesus? Maybe, just maybe, Jesus' wisdom taps into a power far beyond ourselves in which we move in life from the earthly to the supernatural, from the earthly to what is actually godly, from the unspiritual to that which is holy spiritual, and from the demonic to that which flows of living waters from heaven. This is the way. Here in our service, we've left some space, and you'll see it in your bulletin. And space is called the offering. And here's the question for this time as our musicians come back and we get ready to play for us. Here's the question. What might you offer to the Lord today? That's the question for the offering. What might you offer to the Lord today? Now, normally, we roll right into singing. But as we did last week, we're inserting a verse Music will play for a few moments without our voices. And it's a time for you to faithfully seek what you might offer to the Lord that you previously held back. Now, it's a holy moment, but it doesn't have to be a silent moment or a still moment or even a close your eyes kind of moment. It is a space. It is an act of worship. And so maybe for some of you who are prepared to, to give today, this is a, it's a place for you to prepare your offering of, of gifts, of tithes and offerings like that. You can spend this moment just preparing that. The offering plates are located in the the foyer and outside these back two doors. They're on little pedestals here. You'll see them. This may be a time just in this offering. If you're a, a visitor to this church, you need community, you need a local church, just take a little moment, pull that guest information card out of the pew rack. Fill that out just as a, an act of entrusting yourself to be communicated with this, from this church. And this is maybe for the rest of us just a time to seek the Lord in the meekness of wisdom. Is there a part of you, is there a part of your life, is there a part of your wisdom that has not humbled itself to the Lord yet? This is a good opportunity to pray through that. Open yourself up to him during this time. It is an offering of many things. And of course, as always, during our times of singing and of music, this altar's open. You're welcome to come and pray. You're welcome to pray where you are. Let me pray for you, and then we'll enter into this time. Father in heaven, we love you. And you have dealt so faithfully and wise with us in love. May we deal so faithfully and wise in, in, in wisdom to, with you, to your way and to those around us. We pray this in your name. Amen.
you stand? Let's sing together. Jesus, 
As we exit this time of worship, allow me to share a few things with you. The first thing, the best thing I can do for you is to turn your attention to the bulletin. Uh, lots of items there for you to read and to take in about what's going on in the life of the church. Uh, I will invite you uh, to give as an act of, of worship of your tithes and offerings. Again, reminding you those offering plates are located behind you in the foyer and behind me outside these two doors. And you can also give online through our website as well. Uh, you've heard from Catherine already today uh, about our back-to-school event with Hesed House. You'll find the information about that in your bulletin. Uh, still an opportunity to give uh, toward the shoes that we're giving out and, toward, and to give school supplies today. But that event is tomorrow night starting at 5.30 in the Sequoia Mobile Home Community. And we'll, we'll send out a message to the church office tomorrow, a little bit more details about how to, how to get there. So I invite you into that. You are, you are reminded that today is the day uh, in which deacon nominations are due, and so uh, Danny Mint and Mike Shirey and, and Doug Crow and Phil Bates, they're around after the service. You can put those deacon ballots in the offering plates. Or you can, if you find one of them, you can hand it directly to them, and that's a way to get them into them today. Okay, so note of business and ministry and some good news. I'm happy to share, happy to share. Uh, after uh, Amy Simpson uh, departed October 1st after seven years of ministry with First Baptist Church as our children's ministry director, uh, we've gone through these several months, and we've been blessed by the commitment of parents to fill in the gap. We've been blessed by the work of our children's ministry director, Interim, Katherine Johnson. Uh, and uh, we stand here today. Our children's ministry has taken no steps backward, but it has moved forward. It is strong. It is flourishing. Uh, but something to share today. Our children's ministry director search committee, Mark Petty, Hannah Woods, Andrew Reynolds, April McClung, Alexander Buford, and me as chair of the committee, we have concluded our search. And it is a unanimous recommendation. Uh, we have a unanimous recommendation of a candidate to become First Baptist Church's next children's ministry director. Now, we put together a profile of an ideal candidate several months ago of experience and ministry skills and characteristics and education. And so we commend to this church Miss Bailey Bounds. Miss Bailey Bounds is from Petal, Mississippi. Mississippi, all right. We're coming in, coming for you. She's a graduate of the University of Southern Mississippi. She's a current, current student at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary pursuing a Master of Arts in Christian Education, and she has served as the Children's Ministry Associate at Petal Harvey Baptist Church for three years now, and that's about a ministry of about 100 kids weekly. She is a disciple of Jesus. She's one who's going to say to our children, follow me as I follow the example of Christ. She has a clear calling to children's ministry to make disciples of Jesus and to come alongside families. She has the character and the knowledge that we get able to say, say to her and trust her with the ministry of the word to our children. We believe her to be mature in her faith, bright, personable, and of high character. She is relatable and authentic, and she will be a great addition to our staff and to the mission of this church. So Miss Bailey Bounds, she'll be with, with us the weekend of August 17th and 18th. 17th, we'll be, able, we'll be able to meet her and all the children and the families as well. The 18th, she'll be here with us sharing in worship, and of course, there's a vote on that day uh, in regard to calling her as a minister at First Baptist Church. We'll have more information to share about her in a full profile in the coming weeks before she arrives, but we wanted to share with you that incredible news. And so begin praying now, begin seeking now, uh, and being part of that process as we move forward as a church. All right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we are blessed. Would you stand with me uh, for the benediction this morning? If you're willing, would you raise your hand to receive the Lord's blessing? This is from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace.